<clears throat> our main theorem is going to be uh, about exotic surfaces this time. So that's pairs of surfaces in a four manifold, which are topologically isotopic, but not smoothly isotopic. And the particular theorem we're going to spend nearly all of today proving um, is, is work of Kyle Hayden from, from last year. And what it says is that um, there exist disks, di, um, embedded smoothly in B4. They have a common boundary. And they are topologically isotopic. Um, rel boundary, so that topological isotope, you can keep the boundary pointwise fixed, um, but they are not smoothly isotopic. And there I'm, I'm not making any boundary requirement, they're just not smoothly isotopic. So we're gonna prove this using, um, using the same set of tools we've, we've been developing this, this whole time. Um, the proof will come in, in three parts. The first part's gonna be build the stuff. So um, we're gonna build our DI. They're gonna have a boundary some not K, which we'll meet later. And, and there's gonna be one more thing we'll make true about them that, that's sort of not apparent in the theorem statement. And that's that um, the fundamental group of the complement of these disks is going to be Z. And you'll see in a little while why we will want that. And once we've built them, we'll, uh, we'll show their, their top ISO. And then we'll show they're not smoothly isotopic. And that's the plan for the talk. <clears throat> so I want to jump right into building them. Um, but I want to say before I do that, I'm sort of going to jump into the construction and you should just roll with me for a while. It's not going to be clear right away while we're, why we're building like disks or, or really sort of anything. So, so just come along and I'll, and I'll point it out when like, look, there's a four ball. <laughs> look, there's, there's a disk. Look, there's two of them. Okay. So where we're going to start this construction is with a three component link in S3. Um, you get to pick any link you like satisfying the following conditions. So, so you need to um, build it so that if you consider the first two components in isolation, that thing should be isotopic to the hop link. And if you consider the second two components in isolation, that thing should be isotopic to the two component unlink. And first and third are also an unlink. There's an example of a link like this over here to the right. Uh, friendly reminder, I'm braid closing all pictures uh, ever. So, so let's check that we have this. If you squint and pretend you can't see the green curve, then we're meant to believe that A and B are the hop link. So certainly A is an unlink and certainly like the geometric linking is right, right? This blue arc doesn't really need to be stuck there when, when you ignore green. Um, so the only thing you really have to check here is that this blue curve is itself an unknot. And I'm not gonna go through that. Um, this blue curve may look suspiciously similar to a blue curve we had yesterday. You'll see just how similar it is a bit later, um, but, but for, very similar reasons, this, this is indeed an unknot. So, so okay, A and B are not hop link. Um, now what about B and C? Are they the unlink? Um, well, I think so, because you know, if I did draw in a part of my braid closure, then, then we'd see that, and then you can isotope blue sort of through the green there and, and remove that. So this is a two component unlink. And uh, what about, a and C, well, they're just a two component unlink like already in the picture. Very good. Um, by the way, I meant to say at the very beginning, so, so let me pause here to say it. Um, the thing that happened organically yesterday where Kyle answered chat questions uh, worked really well. So uh, the plan for today is um, feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, Kyle will take them. And if there's anything he, he feels I should address, he'll, he'll feed it up to me. Uh, but you can also interrupt me with questions and I'll, I'll have some pauses, um, including now, anything about the statement or, or these links.
Okay, so we drew a three component link in S3. Um, that's like nice, I guess, but we're trying to build disks in the four ball. So um, the first thing we're gonna do is, is we're gonna use these links to define some four manifold, um, actually two of them. So we're gonna consider four manifolds B1 and B2 um, via the, the handle diagrams I'm about to draw over here. So, you take your link and for one copy of it, we're going to think of the red curve as a one handle and the blue curve as a two handle. And we're not gonna do anything with the green curve. <clears throat> uh, that's, that's fine, right? I'm defining a four manifold. This is my construction, just ignore the green curve. So, so very good, this is B1. And our manifold B2 will be uh, the manifold you get by using the blue curve as a one handle. You can do that because the blue curve is an unknot and the red curve as a two handle. <clears throat> the first thing you maybe notice about these, these BI is that they're both four balls. And that's a consequence of the fact that, that we required um, that the red and blue curve are, are the hop link. So when you use that to define a one and two handle pair, um, <clears throat> that's going to give you the four ball, no matter which one you think of as being the one handle. Um, so, so these aren't very interesting four manifolds. They're just two copies of the four ball. But, but I also want to emphasize that we, we have this really nice uh, natural boundary homeomorphism between these two pictures of the four ball. And it's the same trick we use all the time. And, and in fact, you know, that homeomorphism between these pictures, it doesn't look very interesting on the boundary. It, it just identifies them. And so in particular, it takes this green curve, which is still just kind of like sitting around in the boundary of my four ball. It's gonna take this green curve exactly onto this one. So uh, let me give these curves a name. This is C1. So that's some curve in the boundary of the four ball. And here's C2. <clears throat> And so what we're seeing is that phi of C1 equals C2. So these green curves, we're thinking of them as curves in the boundary of the four ball. And we have some homeomorphism of that boundary of S3, throwing one of the curves onto the other one. So that tells me that, that these two curves are actually the same knot in S3. Um, so if you like, you can appeal to the knot complement theorem for that, but you don't have to. This homeomorphism we just wrote down, throwing one knot onto the other, it takes meridians to meridians, so you don't need the full strength of that theorem. So, so far, what I claim we've done with this three-component link is we've used it to draw two kind of funny pictures of the four ball, and we've picked out a curve in the boundary of each of those funny looking four balls. And we actually have decided that those two curves, they're the same knot in S3. Let me, um, let me give that knot a name. It's gonna be K. And let me, let me check in for questions there. Okay, great. Uh, Kyle's making my life easy. So um, we're going to try to find disks uh, whose boundary are this knot, K. Okay? But before we do that, I just want to uh, I want to make a comment about um, what knot this is. So when you look at these green curves in our diagrams, they look like the unknot, but K warning is is not the unknot. <clears throat> um, 
you know, when, when you look at this diagram, the, the red and the blue, you know that that surgery gives you S3 because this is a four ball. Um, but if you actually performed the a homeomorphism taking you from this complicated surgery diagram to the empty surgery diagram of S3, which is where you're used to recognizing knots, uh, then what you'd see is that the image of this green curve goes somewhere complicated. Um, and in fact, you, you could write down where it goes. Um, this is a picture of just the boundary surgery here. There's our knot K in green. It's just been isotoped a little bit. And so if you really wanted to see what, what knot is K, then what you'd want to do is simplify this surgery diagram for S3. And, and how would you literally do that in practice? Um, well, you know, you're, you're used to thinking about removing a canceling one, two pair. And we'll try to do the same thing. We'll try to sort of clear out that red disc um, <clears throat> and, or, or by um, sliding the, the green over blue like that. Uh, and then you can cancel the blue and red. And the reason you can do that cancellation, you know, the reason I'm asserting to you, you can do that cancellation is because you know you can do it at the four manifold level. So it must also work on the boundary. Um, but I think a really nice exercise here uh, is come up with a fully Dane surgery explanation of, of this red and blue cancellation. So, so far, two funny pictures of the four ball, one knot, uh, and we can see it in the boundary of each of our funny pictures. Now let's try to find a pair of disks that that knot bounds. Um, <clears throat> so the observation is, is that, um, well, we can do it. Um, K bounds a disk DI in each of our four balls, BI. So, so let me try to tell you why that is. And, and to do it, let me draw your attention to this schematic picture of four ball number one. So in four ball number one, the red thing is dotted. So I'm thinking of, of you know, cutting out a disc bounded by the red and I'm attaching something um, along the blue. And my knot K, you know, when we, when we look at this diagram, my knot does not interact with the one handle at all. So in the schematic, you know, maybe I see K like over here. And then looking back at my diagram for a second, you know, K bounds a disc, like kind of just in the diagram. And, you know, what does this diagram mean? It really means take the four ball, cut out something over here along red, attach something along blue, exactly as in our schematic. So, so that disc that K bounds in the diagram, that disc really exists right here. Um, and if you don't sort of love that picture, which I don't, you can think about pushing it into the four ball a little bit like that. And that's our disk D1 for K. We're thinking of it as being in, in funny B4 number one. Now, what about our other disk? Uh, well, our other four ball is schematically represented like this. We're now cutting something out along blue. Um, and when you look at the handle diagram of, of four ball number two, you know, the knot does not look like it's completely away from the one handle, um, but it, it can be made to be. This is um, one of our hypotheses. And, and in this literal picture, you know, if I do a little oops, piece of my braid closure, you know, maybe you see that the one handle could be isotoped around like that. And then this green knot, instead of kind of grabbing the one handle right here, it could instead grab the two handle right here. That was all just an isotopy. So now we see that once we've wiggled the picture around a little bit, um, K is really completely split from the one handle in this other four ball as well. Uh, so, you know, maybe in my schematic, it looks something like this. And so for exactly the same reason, K bounds some disk D2 over here. So those are going to be our disks. Right now, 
it shouldn't be clear that they are or are not topolog or isotopic in, in any category. They're just two sort of very, very different disks in that like, we're not even really recognizing them in the same picture of B4. Uh, questions? Okay. So the final thing I'm supposed to check about these disks constructively is that they have, that their complements have pi one Z. Um, so we know how to write down pi one of a four manifold if we have a handle decomposition of that four manifold. So, so that's what we want. Um, and in fact, it's, it's not too hard to, to go from what we already have here to a handle decomposition of these complements. Because you know, let's remember, how did, what is D1? It's, you know, it's what we get, it's the disk we get from taking sort of this disk in the diagram, pushing it and pushing it in a little bit. So the complement of D1 is this four ball where you push in this disk and cut it out. And, and that's something we have notation for. That's exactly this, right? So, <clears throat> in fact, you know, I was until just now thinking of this as a handle diagram for B4, which I just happened to have some green curve drawn in. But now it's honestly a handle diagram of the exterior of D1. And over here at far right, we can do the same thing. We're using the same sort of methods to get our disk. So this is now honestly a handle diagram of the exterior of D2. Um, let, me, uh, let me tell you a sort of trade secret, which is that if you wanna write down a handle diagram with multiple one handles in dotted circle notation, they really should be split from each other because you know, you need to sort of identify these disks that you're going to push in and cut out. And if like the, the curves are linked, it's not clear what disks you're talking about. Um, but sometimes if it is clear what disks you're talking about, because for example, I just went on about it for a while, then, then we like to cheat. So I also want to think about this as a handle diagram for um, the exterior of D2, this middle picture here. Oops. Okay. So, so from these, we're going to try to read off pi one. So, <clears throat> Let's do it. Um, so let me start with the exterior of D1. So, all right, two one handles, that means two uh, generators. Let's mark them. I'll think of this as being a uh, generator R for red, and uh, maybe this is generator G for green. So the fundamental group of this is gonna be these two generators, and then we should get a relator from the two handle. Um, and if we just start here in black and go for a walk around the two handle, we, we read that relator off. Um, so maybe bear with me for a second. Uh, looks like what I see as I walk along is uh, maybe that's G inverse at first. And then we walk over here. So that's R. Keep walking. Uh, lots of walking without going over any one handles. R inverse. Uh, now I'm here, G, and R again, and we're back where we started. And that group is recognizable. So what about the other, the other disc complement? Um, well, you tell me. Um, I mentioned yesterday that when you're writing down the fundamental group of a four manifold with, with multiple one handles, like you really, well, I mean, in, in general, you, you just need to look at generators and write down your relators. And when I look at either of these pictures, I don't really see the generators here. Um, and there's no trickery because you have more than one uh, generator in your word. So um, to do this exercise, you're actually going to have to isotope. Um, one of these diagrams around and, and I'm not going to do a live. Any questions about 
about anything, and in particular about the rest of the construction. I think so far we built a pair of disks, both of them in the four ball. They have a common boundary that's not K, and they both have pi one Z. Okay, so next up, we are going to try to show that these disks are topologically isotopic rel boundary. Um, and in the last two exotic results, when I needed to show manifolds were something topological, in that case, homeomorphic, um, I didn't actually do it. I appealed to theorems of other people that told me how to do it. And uh, we're going to do the same thing here. So um, let me state a theorem. Uh, this dude at and Powell a couple years ago. Um, they said that if you have a pair of disks, uh, just topologically is fine embedded in B4. Uh, these disks have common boundary. And these disks have pi 1z. That's why we wanted that. Then, then you're all good. They're topologically isotopic. Even rel boundary. So, so we get out of that without doing anything, unless you want to invite one of them here and tell them to prove the theorem for you. Great. Part three. Uh, I'm having trouble turning the page. There we go. We're now going to try to show that these disks are not smoothly isotopic. The argument's going to come in three parts. Let me state all the parts, and we'll see. Uh, hopefully, that that if we prove them all, that'll that'll do it. Um, and, th and then I'll talk a little bit about the proof of each part. So, so to get started, what we're going to observe is is that <clears throat> if the disks were smoothly isotopic, then that would give us a diffeomorphism of their complements. And actually, we'd even know some stuff about that diffeomorphism. We would know that if you restricted that diffeomorphism to the, to the boundary, so just look at what it does on the boundary, and, and then in fact, just look at where that sends the not complement. So I'll unpack this in just a second. It's, it's going to have to preserve it. Uh, okay, so so let me say some some words about this. Just the first part. If they're uh, isotopic, then their complements are diffeomorphic, and um, that is something you hopefully in the back of your mind wanted me to say, or something like that, because um, we only have one obstructive tool uh, in our arsenal, and it's you know this this bound on the genus function. So the only thing we really know how to obstruct smoothly is um, manifolds not being diffeomorphic. We don't have anything for showing that surfaces aren't isotopic. So um, turning this surface isotopy problem into a uh, manifold diffeomorphism problem is good news. Um, now, what about the second part? Um, <clears throat> so, so let's think for a second about what disk exteriors look like, disk exteriors in the four ball. Um, here's a schematic over here. Uh, and what, what I want to call your attention to is that, that their boundary is, is something familiar to us. And we've sort of done this exercise before. You know, what's the boundary of this manifold? Well, there's sort of a black bit. That's everything that was in the boundary of the four ball. It wasn't too close to the knot. So the black bit's a knot complement. And the, the green bit is, you know, the boundary of the disk we removed, boundary of the neighborhood of the disk we removed. So that's a solid torus. So. <clears throat> This diffeomorphism restricted to the boundary should be going from the zero surgery on one of our knots to the other. And, and this final claim here is saying that as a diffeomorphism of those two three manifolds, it kind of it respects this partitioning into black and green. It's going to send the black stuff to the black stuff. And so the not complement to the not complement. Okay, so, so I haven't argued that, but that's the first thing we will argue. Then there's, there's sort of two more steps. <clears throat> the second step is um, 
that if you had any uh, homeomorphism from the boundary of the exterior of D1 to the boundary of the exterior of D2, um, which had this property that it sent that it you know preserved that partition. So sends the not complement to the not complement. Um, it's going to have to be isotopic to a homeomorphism we already know about on that region. OK, so let me unpack this. Down here, we have our handle diagrams of our disk exteriors. And we already know about a homeomorphism between their boundaries. As usual, it's the one that, that observes that this is the same surgery diagram as this one. So the boundary homeomorphism is, is nobody move. So what we're checking in, in step B is that if you had any other homeomorphism between these manifolds, if you look at what that other homeomorphism does just on the black parts, just on the not complement, it'll have to be isotopic to the one we know about. <clears throat> and, and the reason we're, we're angling, the reason, the reason you care about this, the reason we're saying it is because ultimately this proof is it's going to work the same as our proof that um, that we had these exotic contractible manifolds. We're going to try to show that no boundary homeomorphisms can extend smoothly. And so what we're showing so far is that um, if we had an isotopy, then it would come from a diffeomorphism that restricted to something special on the boundary. And then step B says everything that does that special thing on the boundary looks like the homeomorphism I already know about. And so what's the final step of the proof going to be? It's going to be that uh, any boundary homeomorphism that looks like the homeomorphism I already know about uh, doesn't extend smoothly. So this is morally the same kind of argument we use for exotic contractible. It's just worse. Um, let me say something about, about why it's worse. Um, you know, with exotic contractible, we, we have this nice thing where we just said, you know, I know about this boundary homeomorphism, I can show it doesn't extend and it's the only one. Great. Um, here, there are more than one boundary homeomorphisms uh, of these disc exteriors. In fact, this is a genus one knot. So the, this zero surgery, that is the boundary of these disc exteriors is not hyperbolic. It has a lot of interesting self homeomorphisms. So we don't get away like, quite as scot free as we did last time. Um, and something I mentioned last time and that came up in office hours is, you know, even if you don't get away scot free, you, you sometimes still have options. So I wanted to show you like what that can sometimes look like. So, so here I don't just get to say the boundary homeo I know about doesn't extend, but I can still. Um, wiggle my way through this by saying, yeah, but boundary homeomorphisms that are the kind that I need to obstruct, there aren't very many of those, something like this. Let me, let me break for questions. Maybe, maybe while I'm, I'm letting people uh, come up with questions, I'll, I'll comment that um, if you really hated this, uh, and you you want to have a simpler proof outline, you can uh, get that at the expense of making your pictures a lot worse. So there do exist exotic disks with a unique boundary homeo from the zero surgery of K to itself. So if you want to, to try to run this again with an easier proof, you can just do worse constructively, um, and that'll be possible. Anybody come up with any questions? It's good. I have like, I give you long pauses for questions, and then people give them to Kyle. Um, it's good to make him work. This is theorem. 
Um, okay, so let me say something about why each of these steps are true. I'm really just going to sketch A and B. Um, and so the sketch for A is not too bad. Um, if we had a, an isotopy between our disks, then uh, we would get an ambient isotopy because everything is smooth. Then, right, so we have these. Uh, these diffeomorphisms would be four so that the final one throws D1 onto D2. And <clears throat> that final diffeomorphism is going to give me my diffeomorphism between my exteriors. You just restrict to the complement. Okay. And because, you know, I know this diffeomorphism here between the exteriors, it came from just restricting to the complement this, this bigger diffeomorphism that threw D1 on to D2. You know, that tells me F1, it takes this onto here. And so when I look at just the complement, I know that sort of the boundary of the neighborhood of this is going to map onto the boundary of the neighborhood of this. And so that's where the sort of the stiffeomorphism will respect the surgery solid torus and the not complement thing comes from. Um, what about the second step? Um, any, any boundary homeomorphism that respects the partition is going to do what mine does on the not complement. Uh, well, that's mostly going to come from using Snappy um, to check that there's only one self homeomorphism of the not complement. Okay. And then there's just like a little bit of fussing around to uh, finish to bootstrap up all the way up to B. So the real thing that um, that I want to spend a minute talking about is 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 item C. Um, if we had a homeomorphism from the boundary of this to the boundary of this that respects the, um, sorry, that, that does, that respects the partition and which, which does what my phi does away from the green curve, then it can't extend to a diffeomorphism of the complements. So there that is stated again. <clears throat> So here we want to use the same sort of trickery we used last time. Um, we only know how to obstruct one type of, we only know how to show sort of one type of manifolds aren't diffeomorphic, and that's manifolds that have some H2 because we'd like to distinguish their genus functions. And disk exteriors don't have any H2. They're, they're homology S1s. Um, the reason you should think that's true is because um, because a one handle in dotted no cir circle notation is a, is a disk complement, but a one handle is also S1 times P3. So that's just like a sanity check that we should feel sort of okay about the fact that disk exteriors are homology S1s. So in particular, they don't have any H2, so we don't know how to tell them apart. So we're gonna use the same trick again um, that we use in the contractible setting. Uh, we're gonna say that if such and F extended to, you know, some diffeomorphism between the exteriors, uh, then those exteriors with some additional two handles glued to them would have to be diffeomorphic. as long as you modify the gluing using F. Okay, so, so same argument as last time. So um, as last time, you're free to, to try to build these disk exteriors out uh, into bigger manifolds that, that you can show aren't diffeomorphic in, in any way you choose. But um, if you'd like a suggestion, I think 
this is a good place to put your additional handles. So this is gamma. Gamma is a link now. That's fine. And this is f of gamma. And um, again, sort of reiterating by this step in the proof where we're assuming that we're working with a boundary homeomorphism, which um, away from our not, so away from the screen curve, does exactly the boundary homeomorphism that we know about. And the boundary homeomorphism we know about sort of identifies these pictures. So um, this really is the image of So I'm gonna let you finish this as an exercise again. Um, what you're gonna show is that uh, this thing over here on the right has a T2 generating H2 and the other one doesn't. Questions? I have one. Um, so is there a, some kind of a formal way, I mean, to formalize this construction that we just did of like going from some contractible exotic manifold pairs to some this complements by, you know, mm -hmm. doing thing like you did here? I guess like here we just replaced a crossing by a new component, but is there a way to formalize this? Um, I, mean, I think if maybe a first round formalization is that, um, huh. well, anytime you have a pair of, of contractible manifolds that have this, you know, the same, hmm, Stating a formalization of it's going to be a little messy. Like, yes, you can turn this into a routine. You're noticing that I basically just took my contractible manifolds from before and um, and did this this funny modification near uh, a clasp, which which turned my interesting contractible manifold into the four ball. And like, yes, you could write down some formalism for that. Um, I'm not sure how general it would be, but but there's something. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I have a quick question too. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's not this K that you're working with. Um, it, it bounds two different like slice disks in the four ball essentially. So I guess you call that doubly slice. Is that the terminology you use? Um, does doubly slice mean that if you glued them together, you'd get this trivial S2 and S4? I, if that's true, then we don't that know that. Um, oh, okay. This is just two disks for now. Right, right, okay. Yeah, I mean, in my mind, doubly slice is kind of just you have these two different disks in the four ball and they're, you know, not the same in some sense, I suppose. Um, yeah. I guess that, that the idea is like, could you do this if you take, you know, the doubly slice not in that sense that you know that there are two different slice disks for it and you essentially want to do this game again. But I mean, the, the trick here is you need a nice, some two different, um, Kirby diagrams for these four balls, so you can see this slice disk just sort of in there. You just turn your knot into the unknot, or it looks like the unknot. So I guess like, would you be able to try to come up with more examples like this if you start with like a doubly slice knot and then add a canceling pair in a convenient way so that you're um, you can see those slice disks easily or something? I don't know if that's like the way you tried to come up with this, or if you sort of came at it from a different angle. Um, I think originally Kyle came at it sort of from, from the, from the middle, the way I just presented it, but there are situations where we know how to do what you just proposed, sort of given two discs, we can kind of back solve a weird picture of the four ball that we can dot zero and see them both in, but I don't think we know how to do that completely systematically and, and we'd really like okay. to, um, 
let me say something more broad because because this made the open problem list. Um, I wasn't planning to write this down, but you know how there's a quark theorem for homeomorphic manifolds, which says that they're always related by cutting out something contractible and replacing it by something else contractible. Um, we'd really like to see a quark theorem for surfaces in four manifolds, um, which might say that, okay, a, a version I'd really like to see would say that any pair of topologically isotopic four uh, surfaces in a simply connected four manifold are related by removing a four ball that intersects the surface and gluing back in another four ball that contains some other surface bit. Uh, and that'll get you between them. And um, I think we, we sort of know how to do that if instead of saying four ball, you just say contractible. But if you really want to say it's it's like this, it's B4s. Um, it's a little harder. I don't know how to do it. More questions? I have a whole slide full of questions actually. Um, so let me ask some of mine and people can intersperse them with um, yours. So I don't have a, um, a slick corollary um, to, to follow Kyle's theorem presently. Um, Y'all should prove one. But in the meantime, let me, let me just ask you a bunch of questions that I think follow from, from this result. So um, the first one is like, did we really need Z there? Uh, can you come up with exotic disks with other pi one. And um, let me let me suggest that there's a good uh, a good pi one you might want to aim for as your first shot. Um, and it would be maybe this group that has this presentation, which is sometimes called the bomb slug solitaire group. And the reason uh, this is a good first group to aim for is that um, here, the, the topological situation is, is understood. So this was also gone by Bell. Uh, so they show basically the theorem um, from before. So if you have a pair of disks embedded in B4, common boundary, uh, pi one of the exteriors is this group. Um, and one more condition, there's an algebraic condition uh, for this group, which I'm not gonna tell you what it is. Uh, but if you meet it, uh, then you get the, the same conclusion the disks are isotopic, topologically, rel boundary. So, so this is a good uh, candidate group for other exotic disks. Um, and it's it's not very hard, you, you could do it as an exercise to use Kyle's construction to build yourself a pair of disks in the four ball that have this group. Um, the trouble is, is that when I've done that in practice, I don't hit the algebraic condition. Like Kyle got, uh, he put himself in a good situation with pi one Z, which is that it just didn't say anything here. So as long as he got his fundamental group right, then they were just topologically isotopic. And here you have to, you have to arrange a little more. Um, and so the reason I like this problem is that this basically says get better at Kyle's construction. Uh, and, and I just sort of think that's probably fundamentally like a good time. And this is something you would prove out of that. So this is a question. Somebody here should do this. Um, somebody unmuted there. Is there a question before I give ask a question? Okay, here's another. Um, are all pushed in ciphered surfaces uh, isotopic to each other? So we went through this whole thing at the beginning to build a pair of disks that had a common boundary in the four ball, but you know, you know a, a nice three manifold topological way to build a pair of surfaces, at least in the four ball that have a common boundary, just build a pair of surfaces for a knot in S3 and push them in, right? Um, and, and in fact, um, something you can check 
is um, that pi one of the exterior of a pushed in cipher surface is zip. Um, but we don't we don't know if there's we well we don't know the answer to this. Um, and I think this is a, a really nice um, kind of elementary question. Um, okay, another question that comes up. So we just showed existence. There are exotic disks in the four ball. Now, what about how many? Um, so in particular, maybe are all um, K that are slice? And, and maybe you want to assume that they have Alexander polynomial one that'll allow you to have a pi one Z disk. Do all of these knots um, bound exotic disks? Um, and do they bound infinitely many such? And maybe a final question, and this is the, the most exciting question of them, um, is do there exist exotic Z, uh, so pi one Z surfaces for the unknot? Uh, so, you know, it didn't really matter in the proof we just gave what K was. Like, I didn't even actually bother to write it down. Uh, so hypothetically, we could have done this construction and, and it turned out that, that K was the unknot um, if we'd done something clever. And uh, that would be really good news. Let me tell you why. Um, so there's a lemma, which says that if you have two closed surfaces in the four ball that are smoothly isotopic, uh, then from those closed surfaces, oh, sorry, the lemma is more general. These are closed surfaces anywhere. Um, then from those two smoothly isotopic closed surfaces, uh, what you can do is, is you can puncture both the ambient manifold and the surface and just do this with a very small four ball so that all you see right here is like an S3 boundary component to your manifold and a little unknot um, along your surface. Um, <clears throat> so so what, you, what you can conclude is that um, the closed surfaces are going to be isotopic if and only if the punctured surfaces are isotopic. And so in particular, if you build exotic surfaces for the unknot in V4, um, you get exotic closed surfaces in V4. And that's something people would uh, really, really like to have. And, and you know, maybe one of the uh, questions you're supposed to ask me every time I prove a theorem here is like, could this have worked in the closed setting? And the answer here so far to some small extent seems to be, yeah, just do the same thing, but, but better get an unknot. Uh, questions? Hi, Lisa. <laughs> it's Paul, Melbourne. Uh, uh, I tuned in a little late, but let's see, these are interesting. I just want to make a comment that the second question you posed about pushed in ciphered surfaces was it was addressed. It's one of my favorite questions, but it was addressed by Chuck Livingston in the early 80s, and he asked exactly this question um, and showed, for example, that there are certain pretzel knots that have two distinct minimal genus surfaces in the three sphere, but uh, these, these are well-known examples. And, but if you push them both in, they become isotopic. So there are many examples where that's the case. So one can attack this problem using Kovanov homology, sort of relative invariance, but no one has succeeded in actually producing examples where they aren't. I, I will mention that there's also examples by um, Alford of of ciphered surfaces where the I think like even like the complements the complements aren't even um, like the complement of the surface aren't even homeomorphic. But I worked this out with um, Ben Repic, and it turns out that the once you bring them into B four, they're actually as well isotopic. So there there actually are some like so even slightly more complicated because because the for the pretzels they're all. They're all free, right? The um, the, the yes, 
the fundamental group. Yeah. Yeah. And one further question, maybe, about your third question. Um, is there something known if K is ribbon about this question? And so it, I guess a follow-up is, if you had such an exotic disc, would that definitely be a disc that is not ribbon, not isotopic to ribbon? Not. Um, no. The, for example, the exotic discs that we just built are both ribbon. Um, that can be checked pretty readily. Ah, okay. Um, and I don't think starting with a ribbon not really... I don't see how that helps you fit it into Kyle's construction, for example. So I, I don't know if that helps us know that, that there's something exotic. Okay. Thank you. Um, One, question. One question is, does, does Kyle's, so Kyle's result doesn't work if you just like connect some on a slice knot or a, a ribbon knot or whatever, and just connect some on that disc. It, it like the obstruction falls apart. It um, kills pi one. I mean that changes. Well, yeah, pi yeah, one. but but like you can still you you still know that that sum end is isotopic, um, and so then of course when you when you connect sum it it should still be isotopic. So that part should still follow, right? If you're uh, just kind of boundary connect summing the two disks. But I'm trying to say I give you my favorite slice knot. You produce exotic disks for it. And so yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm at the first question, the exotic disks with other oh. pi ones. Oh, like, uh -huh, I see. Connect some on. So maybe, maybe you want like prime, but like. Yeah, good. That's a good question. Yeah. Or a good point. Yeah. Um, it, it, it does, that does work. Um, I, I think we can make an argument that the production is fairly robust under ribbon concordance. Um, and so, you know, the uh, tacking on things like that, pretty safe. But I agree, I think it's not morally the same. Like, I think that what Lisa was constructing was going back to the construction and choosing something whose exotic guts themselves didn't rely on having pi one z. But, but it's true, you could definitely get interesting fundamental groups that way. It's a good point. Um. So I have a problem that's like possibly new in the history of giving a course, which is that um, I actually prepared like, well, it's going to take me less time than I needed to, um, to prove all these theorems that we're going to prove. So um, we have some options for the next uh, six minutes. I can, can um, give you some other cool constructions that are kind of similar to Kyle's. Um, and then in the extra time I'm going to have next time, I can try to show you what to do with them. Um, or we can wrap and go outside because we've been on Zoom for a long time and it's, it's 620 anyway, and, and who cares if we started late? Um, any organizers want to chime in? Um, yeah, I mean, we can wrap up so people can get a little screen break and have time to grab food. Um, so I guess um, let's uh, thank Lisa for... Um, Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so we can, so it's 1220, uh, we can have, let's say whether we have other questions for Lisa, if not, um, we can have our group photo from uh, 1220 to 1225, and then we can grab our lunch, start the uh, discussion in for the lightning talk. Uh, are there other questions for Lisa? Um, are you able to show those other extra constructions tomorrow? Is there not time for both? Um, I don't know. I'll see. Great. So if there are no other questions for Lisa, we can just thank Lisa again.